There could be a big shakeup coming for businesses in the U.S., a ban on non-compete agreements. These have been standard across many industries, high tech, medical, media, manufacturing, you name it. But now that could all change under a new rule from the FTC. So what does it mean? We're going to break it down today in our Legal Connections episode. Expert Connections starts now. Today, we're talking non-competes and a new rule that could have them banned. Welcome to Expert Connections. I'm Julie Holton. If you are in a competitive industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Under a non-compete agreement, when an employee leaves, they're essentially saying that they agree not to work for a competitor or to start their own business that would compete in the same industry. In non-legal terms, it's kind of like a breakup rule when you agree we're parting ways, but let's not see other people or companies for a while. But it's also more complicated than that. So today we're going to turn to our legal connections expert to break it down for us. Attorney Tony Delamonte from Foster Swift joins us. Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks, Julie. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here because I think this is, uh, you know, non-compete agreements are something that for employees tend to be, you know, such a a hassle when they're trying to, I mean, hassle is like really even putting it lightly when you're trying to be competitive and change jobs within an industry can really stop your ability to continue doing what you do best. But for employers, of course, you don't want your best talent to leave with your trade secret. So it's really been a tricky area for a long time. Can you first provide an overview of the FTC's proposed rule on non-compete agreements and what led to this decision and and what can we expect to be the primary goals behind it? Sure. So you know, non-compete agreements have been in the news lately because of this rule. Uh, Back in January, the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, uh, proposed a rule that would do three things. One was forbid employers from entering into non-compete agreements with their workers, including independent contractors, period. That's that's it. You can't enter into one anymore. Two is rescind existing non-compete agreements that you've entered into previous to that rule. And three is require employers to provide individualized notice to employees who signed a non-compete agreement in the past, uh, basically telling them that those agreements are no longer in effect and may not be enforced. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, You know, like you mentioned, employees, um, you know, it's a headache for them. Employers, they like, um, you know, these types of agreements when you're trying to protect trade secrets or, you know, have star employees you don't want, you know, going to the other uh, side of the street. And so the FTC's basis for this rule is essentially that non-compete clauses or agreements are an unfair method of competition. And there's been a push from Congress and states around the country, um, you know, to do away with non-compete agreements. Um, You know, some states already have complete bans like California. And as recent as last month, New York and Minnesota have pending state legislation to do away with them as well. So these agreements are becoming increasingly not very popular. Um, And so the FTC's position is that it depresses wages, you know, it hurts the economy, it hurts the worker. And by doing away with non-competes, you're going to increase wages, increase, you know, employee mobility, um, and, you know, actually increase, uh, you know, the benefit to the economy. And obviously, on the employer side, you know, they challenge those Um, you know, statements saying that it's going to hurt competition, you're going to have your best people stealing trade secrets and things like that. So um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But that's that's sort of an overview of what the ban is. I can definitely see those benefits you mentioned on the employee side. But what about business? You you mentioned a few of, of those kind of sticking points for businesses. It seems like this proposed rule could really have an impact, especially in highly competitive industries, you know, talking, you know, big tech, for instance, um, where it's very common, you know, if you work at Apple, you can't leave to work at Adobe and and vice versa. How do you see this impacting? And by the way, not just high tech. I mean, we have here, you know, in small towns and big towns, every, you know, businesses, all sizes in between have 
traditionally had these non-compete agreements. How do you see this impacting businesses? I think it's going to have a huge impact. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, one of the big things um, with this proposed rule is there's no wage limit. So that means, you know, hypothetically, that the CEO of a major tech company could jump ship and go to another tech company, you know, and um, I think it's still up for debate, you know, the scope of what this rule is really going to cover. Um, you know, I, I just want to point out that there really aren't any exceptions to this rule. So um, industries where employees are dealing with proprietary and trade secret information, you know, those are going to be industries that are really going to be impacted here unless revisions are made to the FTC rule, um, you know, because as it stands, it's, it's sort of like, a, you know, cross the board, can't have them at all. Um, so, I, I mean, it'll be, it'll be really interesting. Okay, so let's talk about exceptions. You said, are, are there any limitations to this rule as it stands right now? Or what do you expect to see there? So it's basically a blanket ban on all non-competes, um, except there's one, there's one exception, and that is non-compete agreements related to the sale of a business, um, you know, where a person or an entity is a 25% owner. So, you know, Julie, if you owned a, a business and you're a 50% owner and you know, you get to the point where you want to sell it and you you find a buyer and they come in and, you know, you get the deal done, um, but they want you to sign a non-compete saying you're not going to open up the same shop, you know, a month later. Um, that's likely going to be enforced. But other than that, there's there's really no other exceptions. And I also want to point out that it's not just, you know, specifically non-compete clauses. The FTC rule also provides that de facto non-compete agreements that have the effect of prohibiting employment are also banned. Um, and they tell us that de facto agreements include broad non-disclosure agreements, broad confidentiality agreements, and other clauses, you know, for example, um, where, you know, you hire an employee and you tell them they have to stay for X amount of time. And if they don't, you have to pay you back for training costs. Those will also be banned. So, um, you know, it's not just, you know, the title of the agreement is a non-compete agreement. It's, it's all agreements or clauses that have the effect of prohibiting um, movement of, of employment. Um, and so that's, I mean, it's a big deal and it's going to require employers to, you know, look at their agreements and decide, you know, uh, is this enforceable or not? And, you know, is this narrowly tailored or not? So um, it's a big deal. And I bet in our audience, we have a lot of business leaders really taking note on that because it, like there isn't a workaround. You can't just loophole your way in through a different agreement or a different, you know, part of the, the hiring stipulation. So I'm curious. So you're based in in uh, Michigan. How does this ban, for instance, um, or this this rule, how would this align with Michigan laws? So in Michigan, non-compete agreements are currently enforceable um, so long as they are reasonable in time, scope, and geography. Um, you know, I think the last, you know, year, two years or so, they're becoming increasingly unpopular, but that doesn't mean that they're not, you know, enforceable under law and, you know, in our courts. But if this rule goes into effect, it's essentially a federal law and it would preempt and supersede uh, Michigan law. And so the federal law will govern, the FTC's rule would govern, and basically Michigan's practice of, you know, allowing non-competes, um, you know, would be done. And that goes for, you know, all uh, state laws across the country, um, you know, so long as the FTC rule is more stringent than a state law. And I think maybe aside from California, it would be more stringent than all state laws. Um, you know, the FTC rule will uh, govern. You know, it seems to me that someone's going to challenge this, you know, so I'm just curious, do you anticipate, is the legal community already anticipating any major challenges or um, what are your thoughts on that? So we just wrapped up the comment period um, of the proposed rule where uh, they basically opened it up for businesses and individuals to submit comments on what they think about the rule. And they're going to review those and, you know, potentially make changes. And I think they received like 25,000 comments. Um, and 
the voting on the rule won't happen until April of 2024. And so after that point, you know, I, I do anticipate, you know, some litigation um, to, or some business groups to challenge the rule if it goes into effect as is, um, you know, I think one of the main issues that will be challenged is the ability for a federal agency to supersede decades of state law. Um, you know, there's actually a Supreme Court case pending right now um, that deals with that issue, not, you know, related to non-competes, but, um, you know, I, I do anticipate it to be a challenge, but we still have a little bit of time now until we get to that point. I understand that the NLRB has also joined the FTC in its efforts to ban non-competes. Can you explain what's going on with that? Yeah, so, you know, this is a big deal, too. Um, so the National Labor Relations Board, which is the independent federal agency that enforces U.S. labor law, um, its general counsel sent out a memo to all regional directors and regions. And, and here in Michigan, we have Region 7 in Detroit. Um, basically setting forth her view that enforcement of non-compete provisions in employment contracts and severance agreements violates the National Labor Relations Act, um, except in really limited circumstances. And the memo explains that overbroad non-compete agreements restrict employees uh, from exercising their rights under Section 7 of the NLRA, which is the law that allows you to unionize and take collective action to improve your working conditions. So, you know, the question is, what is considered overbroad? And, you know, the NLRB considers non-compete provisions to be overbroad when it could be reasonably interpreted to deny employees the ability to seek other employment opportunities they're qualified for. And so, you know, that's that's almost the definition of a non-compete agreement. Um, and so the the general counsel also specifically targets low and middle middle wage workers um, who lack access to trade secrets or other protectable interests, arguing that you know such provisions are are unenforceable and would would be unlawful. So similar to the FTC ban, there's very few exceptions uh, to to the general counsel's interpretation. Um, you know, they stated that there might be circumstances in which a narrowly tailored non-compete is justified under special circumstances, but none of that is defined. Um, and, you know, we we don't know what that means right now. OK, so how does this mem does this memo create a different rule or how does this affect the non-compete landscape? Yeah, so I mean that's a great question. What does this all mean? You know, what what is a general counsel sending a memo to regions mean for employers and for businesses around the country? So it doesn't itself create a binding rule, but it's basically putting everyone on notice that the NLRB is asking its regions nationwide to submit cases to the general counsel's office in DC challenging non-compete clauses. So there isn't a binding precedent right now under um, NLRB's rules or any case law um, that's dealt with this issue before, but they're, they want it to be binding precedent. They want non-compete agreements to violate the National Labor Relations Act. And so how this would work is um, they're asking businesses to or they're asking individuals where, you know, let's say Johnny, um, you know, worked at uh, a place for 10 years and he has a non-compete and now he wants to leave, but uh, his um, employer is trying to enforce that non-compete on him. And let's say this is all before the FTC rule goes into place. Johnny could go online and submit an unfair labor practice charge to the NLRB and the NLRB could investigate and determine if this is one of those cases they want to send to DC to, you know, potentially create that precedent that non-compete agreements are unenforceable um, and unlawful. Um, and so it's a big deal. And if a case does go to DC, it goes in front of a five-member board. And if the majority agrees with her interpretation, then that case becomes a uh, binding precedent. So, um, you know, this is the NLRB is taking real action here to try to establish that non-compete non agreements are unlawful. And, you know, it's a big deal. 
Okay, so we've been looking at the timeline of this FTC rule as being potentially April of 2024. Could this NLRB or, you know, could this, uh, could the NLRB issue its own rule prior to that? Could that come sooner? So it's it's not really that they're, they can issue their own rule. It's that they're looking for these cases now. And, you know, whether or not it, it becomes binding precedent, you know, and, and you know, the uh, a case in D.C. establishes that a non-compete agreement can violate the National Labor Relations Act. That's that's kind of a separate issue. The real issue for businesses is that, you know, you could get slapped with one of these unfair labor practice charges and you're in the middle of litigation against the NLRB. And it's an incredible headache and it's time consuming and it's costly. Um, and, you know, it, it, and it, it's happening now in terms of timeline. We've seen, you know, the Region 7 in Detroit is, is looking for these cases, and we've actually seen some cases being submitted, um, you know, to the region on, on the issue of non-competes. And so it's now is, is the timeline on this particular issue. Okay, and certainly there is no business that wants to face litigation. So what steps should businesses be taking now? You said this is a this is a now timeline. So what what do you recommend that businesses be doing right now? Well, I think there's a couple things that businesses can do. Um, you know, I think it's really important that you carefully review your non-compete provisions. Um, in your employment agreements and your severance agreements to ensure that they're, you know, narrowly tailored um, and, and have a specific legitimate business purpose behind them and that you can articulate that purpose. Um, you know, I think it's really important that employers consider and evaluate the risk of asking, you know, low or middle wage workers to sign off on non-compete agreements, um, you know, even asking a low wage worker to sign a, a non-compete agreement could be considered uh, unfair labor practice, according to the NLRB. So, you know, I, I think really analyzing and evaluating, you know, the business's use of these agreements, um, you know, from the NLRB perspective, and then from the FTC proposed rule, I think, you know, again, we have a little time there, but it, it would be advisable, you know, if you're a business to take an inventory of all those agreements you have, look at your restrictive covenants and kind of do an assessment on, you know, what are your trade secrets? What are the things that you're trying to protect um, and analyzing whether or not there's less, less restrictive means of doing that um, and whether your agreements are, again, narrowly tailored to um, satisfy your, your business interests. And certainly talk with your attorney, with your counsel, if you don't have that, seek that out to be making these decisions. You know, Tony, it, it strikes me that um, now as a business owner, you know, I'm very interested on the business side of things because this is going to, for many businesses, it seems, just kind of um, transform how they look at everything. You know, when you're talking about your people being your greatest assets, and now if you if you currently have a non compete agreement in place, you might feel that that comfort that if someone leaves, they're not they're not going to become a competitor, they're not going to take your trade secrets, they're not going to at least take the knowledge they have or this vital asset that you have that you need to run your business. But from the from the employee standpoint. You know, I remember, you know, more than 15 years ago, I spent a decade working in the media industry and non-competes were, I mean, they were the, the lifeblood that kept stations, TV stations where I worked competitive with one another. You know, that non-compete agreement, like you said, you know, in Michigan, for instance, has that, that radius. So you couldn't work at another station, a competing station within 90 miles. So from an employee aspect, it controlled where you could live what you could do for a job. And those non-competes also remained in effect if the station were to fire you or to terminate your contract. And so you could find your job yourself out of a job and having to, you know, relocate in order to be able to stay within your industry. So, you know, even from my own perspective, I'm I'm thinking about this and this is just 
huge and how this is going to transform the landscape. I'm curious, kind of from a, a non-legal, more of just a personal opinion side, do you think that we're going to see um, perhaps as a side effect of this, maybe employers being more competitive with benefits or, you know, having to change the internal workings of their companies to, to retain employees now that they don't have or won't be able to have these agreements in place? What, what do you think we could see? Just kind of like, you know, if you have your, your crystal ball and you're looking ahead, does it, doesn't it seem like this could really transform things? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, uh, employers have, you know, some tools in their toolbox on, you know, retention and how you want to keep and reward employees. And so, you know, if you were a business and you were using, you know, non-competes in the past, you know, I think you, you're, you're absolutely right. You have to resort to other things that, you know, may benefit the employee more like, you know, higher salary, higher wages, um, increased benefits, things like that. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think um, from the employee standpoint, it's, you know, it's a good thing. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I, the FTC argues that it, it's going to increase wages, increase career mobility, um, you know, uh, and overall benefit the employee. Um, so, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. Tony, thanks for being on the show today. We'll include your contact information in the show notes so people can reach out to you with more questions. Thanks again for being on the show. Be sure, audience, to subscribe. That's how we keep the show going. And also check out the other videos in our Legal Connections segment. That's all for this episode of Expert Connections. I'm Julie Holton. We'll see you next week.